Welcome back to Call Me By Your Game, the podcast where I, your host, Connor McCabe, bring on a guest to hear from them about a meaningful or memorable video game from a particular moment in their life. On the show, we talk as much about what made playing that game special or, or what sticks out to the guest to this day as we will get into the context of when they had this memorable or meaningful time with it in the first place. A little bit of housekeeping up top is that uh, is that what, what I, I was trying to think of, of like a clever uh, segue into like election talk because we've got an election on our Patreon network, folks. Oh my gosh! Be sure to register to vote uh, because uh, this currently going on when this podcast releases is our election for the game that will become the what what we cover on our quarter for games club series uh as a lot of you will know um if you are a dj toad patron if you subscribe to the network at the ten dollar dj toad tier meaning you get three bonus podcasts a freaking week that's 12 a month folks then you uh get to help determine what game we play for several months and cover with a fine tooth comb for our games club uh so if you're listening to this right now and you're a patron already thank you so much and if you're considering joining, let me tell you the nominees. We got five for you. The nominees for the Quarter 4 Games Club are Broken Age, Control, Papers, Please, Resident Evil 2 Remake, and Rise of the Tomb Raider. I'm going to uh, break the seal between me and my guest really quick and ask, uh, Sam, have you played any of those games? I have not, no. Hey, well, that makes two of us, pal. I haven't played a single one, mm-hmm. so I'm kind of excited to see... Uh, what what people end up choosing uh anyway the voting for this will end on uh let me go ahead and pull up the date here on friday uh october 6th at 12 p.m so if you're listening to this on the day it comes out on that wednesday you still have a couple days to subscribe at that ten dollar dj toad tier vote for what game you want us to cover and listen to the entire series and get a bunch of crap there uh that's the plug for the patreon we also are all over social media if you want to follow the show and support us and see what we have going on every gosh darn week, you can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Blue Sky. And anything we plug today, there'll be a link in the show notes. You can go ahead and click that. Don't even have to uh, remember what the usernames are. You can support the show a few different other ways by leaving us a rating and review wherever you get your podcasts, whether that's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or the soon-to-be-defunct Google Podcast is the news just broke that Google's getting rid of their podcast platform. Um, and if you leave one on Apple Podcasts, I can see those publicly. I'll read it on the show. And if you leave one somewhere else and you'd like me to read it, uh, I'd be happy to do that. Just send it to me. DM me uh, what your review said and I'll shout you out. Uh, anyway, uh, you can also share the show with a friend, whether they love the game today or the game uh, or just video games in general. That's enough for the housekeeping. Well, we we did our chores. Now we can finally have a have a buddy over, have a friend on the show, uh, and have a great time. So please welcome our guest for today's episode, improviser Sam D. Hey everybody, thanks for having me, Connor. Hey, you are so gosh darn welcome. Uh, like I was telling you before the show, I couldn't believe what I had let transpire. You um, have been on the wonderful Reactivators podcast, another show on this network that people are very familiar with multiple times, including last week with a former guest of the show, uh, Asan Williams. And I was just like, Sam, I haven't had Sam on the show. I got to get you on. So uh, I'm like I said before, I know I'm repeating myself. So excited to have you on, Sam. Uh, if you if you were to summarize your experience on the Reactivators podcast uh, in, in in a sentence or two. What would it be? And, and just so you know, Tyler and Nick are not listening. <laughs> wow. Uh, one sentence. Um, uh, fun. S- silly. Wow. Uh, high pressured. Oh, high pressured. I love it. Uh, now, is yeah. that because of the uh, the improv nature or, you know, the re- excuse me, they don't they don't do improv on the podcast until recently. Uh, is that because of the improv nature or because, you know, uh, you're just really wanting to make a good impression in front of the those two kings? I think it's because I I feel like I don't know as much about games as them, so it's always like I gotta like gotta stay on top of it. Gotta make sure I catch all these references. Yeah, don't miss a thing. Uh, there's a lot that flies around on that show. Um, well, uh, you know, listener, if you haven't heard Sam's episodes, go check them out. As, as recently as at the time of this recording, two weeks ago, uh, was on another fantastic episode. Um, Sam, I know you 
how I know the majority of the guests on this show through the Los Angeles uh, improv community. Uh, I'm I'm not able to pinpoint the exact moment where we became we came face to face and finally got to re- like you know know each other as people. But I do remember vaguely the time when uh, you entered my consciousness. And this would have been when you were on uh, Roxbury, uh, the same team as my dear friend, I almost said at the time as if we're not friends anymore, we're, we're actually better <laughs> friends than we were then, uh, Mike Christian. Um, and I, I remember meeting you uh, on that team and then, you know, just saw you around more and more over the years and 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 whatnot. Um is there any like am I missing some big momentous meeting or or is it kind of like that to you like a vague like classic hey you meet a million people in improv and that's sort of how it happened? It it was vague for me at first, but actually now that you bring that up, I I think I remember the exact moment. Oh, that good. We met, not to be creepy. <laughs> no, please, because I'm usually doing that to the guests, so this will be a fun role reversal. Okay, yeah, it was um, right when I was on uh, Roxbury uh, awesome. at the Inner Sanctum. I watched you do a character bit. Oh, and, really? Yeah, yeah. And then I was sitting next to Mike, and afterwards he introduced me. Oh my gosh, that's incredible. Um, yeah. Uh, I wonder what I could have. I think I remember I didn't do a ton of character bits at the Sanctum, so it was probably was it one where I was. I mean, speaking of video games, I mean, you might not remember. Was I playing a guy who was like working on like a phone hotline? With a little headpiece. That sounds super, yeah, because you were like addressed, you were facing the audience the entire time. Yes. And I remember, yeah. Okay, cool. That is uh, yeah. so funny. For, for the listener, which I'm sure that they're just dying to know, Sam, what was going on with that character. I was, I think I was genuinely, I was playing like a dad who was like working at like the Nintendo hotline to help. I don't remember what the character bit was. I, I think I was like, Maybe telling kids how to be better children. I, I have no clue. That sounds. I definitely remember it was like a dad or a son. There was like f- there was like a father element. Yes, to it for that sure. I remember laughing at. You know, I should lean more on those father elements in my comedy. Um, well, hey, thank you for you know uh, finding the missing piece to the puzzle. Uh, yeah. It's that was really fun for me to have someone remember the first time because it's normally I have a what I would describe as a creepy good memory. Where I can mm, me too. Actually, yeah? yeah. Okay. So you yeah, yeah, yeah. we understand each other very well. Yes. Um, yes. So much to the point where like I will be convinced that there's no way someone will like remember me from like a single meeting that we've had, and I might like pretend as if we've never met before because I don't want them to be like have that uh, sort of uh, deer in the headlights look of like oh shit I don't know who this person is. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, that also maybe be going too far, and maybe I should just like not pretend that I don't know somebody who knows no I uh a few weeks ago I was talking to my friend and she was talking about her dad and this is not even a cl- like that close of a friend yeah and I I remember her dad's name and I brought it up and she was like no that's not you shouldn't know that you should not know that <laughs> you're like I can't help it I, I thought I was being personal here uh, yeah exactly that's so funny uh and I'm sure that person's listening right now and she you know who you are out there yeah. um yeah, that's that's so funny. But that was a really long winded way to be like, that's how we, you know, came to know each other. And of course, I've gotten to see you around even more often uh, over the past like six or seven months because you're on Herald Night now with Headbutt. But what do you want to share about yourself? Who is Sam D? What do you want the people to know about you? Uh, yeah, I'm on uh, Headbutt Monday nights, Herald Night, UCB. Um, uh Comedian, improviser. Uh, from Mississippi? Yes. See, that's oh, yeah. where my creepy wow. memory comes in. Wow. And what is my dad's name? <sighs> it's Clark. No. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. From from Mississippi, uh, you can catch me performing around LA. Killer. Uh, yeah. and, and since we've already been down this like uh, creepy memory train, I will let you know I was thinking about it earlier because before the podcast because I was like... I know Sam is from like a southern state and mm-hmm. my girlfriend's from Georgia so but I was like I it's kind of like Georgia but it's not Georgia <laughs> so I but when it came to me earlier before I said it to you I was pretty confident so um anyway yeah you can get you can get Sam 
uh, every other Monday night at the UCB Theater. I'll put a link to the next Headbutt show in the show notes uh, as well so anybody can go you know, buy a ticket and go support a fantastic team. Former guests we already talked about, Asan. We also have another Williams. Austin Williams uh, mm-hmm. is on that team as well. And hopefully future guests. Oh, Meredith, I just had on like, oh, nice. like three weeks ago. So anyway, great team. Go, go check them out for some wonderful improv. Um, Sam, uh, pretty mm-hmm. soon we're going to talk about your history with video games in general. But before we do, will you please tell us uh, what you've brought on, what game you've brought on for the main event later today, and call me by your game. Yes, the game I've prepared today is uh, Dynasty Warriors 4. Fantastic. Can't wait to get into it. Uh, it's always it genuinely. I don't know if it's more fun for me to have on someone who brings on a game I really adore, or a game that I know so little about that I'm just like learning so much. So I'm really excited because this is one that I don't know a ton about. Well, didn't know a ton about until doing a little preparation for the show. So I'm excited. Um, okay. I do want to hear about your history though with games in general. What are do you have like some early memories? of uh like some of your earliest memories of either playing video games or watching someone else play yeah i think um so i i grew up with a brother he was eight years older than me mm. and always way bigger than me and so i watched him play a lot of video games <laughs> uh our first console was the like nintendo um i want to say nes yeah. with like super mario brothers duck hunt wow. all that stuff yes uh, and there was like a FIFA game there too, I think. Mm. <laughs> um, and I would just watch him play. I would try to play, but like I just didn't have the hand-eye coordination to really get it. Yeah. So a lot of watching him play that. A lot of watching um, my brother and his friends play Mortal Kombat on Sega Genesis. Oh, cool. Yeah. And then, oh, like the Bond games on N64. Oh, nice, nice. So that's mm-hmm. great. That's a, that's a nice... A uh, healthy smattering uh, of, of games uh, of like different genres and different consoles. Um, do you remember the first time that like you uh, had enough of an interest or like or or took enough of an interest to either engage with the game for the first time in a significant way or like have your first game? I feel like so many of my early gaming memories were like my older brother and his friends saying like, no, you're not ready for this. You're, you're, you're not ready for this. And it like imprinted on me. So yes. like, I was like, I can't touch a video game. I'm, I'm too young to, to They're touch gonna this controller. They're going to ID me. Yeah. I'm going to like, I'm going to ruin it. I, I can't <laughs> handle this. So just like most of my early memories playing video games was just like watching I think the one time I played Mortal Kombat for the first time, I was just so scared of dying <laughs> yeah. that like I, I was like freaking out, and then I, I just like dropped the controller and I was like, I can't do this, I, I can't take it. If, you know, if you die in the game, you die in real life. I get it. Uh, it is yeah. a pretty violent game, though. Especially, uh, I know I'm sure you know now the graphics look uh, quite um, elementary compared to what we're used to, but at the time, mm-hmm. like especially for a young kid, that would be scary. Yeah, and I think also, like, I was probably, like, five, and all the kids around me were, like, 13, like, my brother's age. Yes. So it's like, if I fuck up, I'm I'm toast. Yes, that is a yeah. significant age gap. It's it's a lot different than, like, oh, your older sibling is, like, three years older than you, and you'd be a freshman when they're a senior, or, you know, third grade when they're in six, but eight. That's, like, mm-hmm. that's, uh, yeah, that's, a, it's like, a whole nother you could have been born and then some and still not reach that um yeah do you like uh remember um what was this you said you you know of course watch your brother and his friends play would they like was this something they did a lot or was just like when they would do it you just remembered that uh i think they would do it a lot i think like whenever there would be these like uh parent parties yeah like adults would hang out and the kids have to go off (laughs) Yeah, yeah. The kids would go off, and then it would be like, oh, this kid has the N64, this kid has the Genesis, and then they would all, like, congregate and, like, around one TV, and then it would be maybe, like, 15 kids. Almost like a basketball court, like, who's got next? For sure. You know? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Waiting to go up, and then I would just stand in the back watching. Absolutely. I mean, that's a great, uh, like, analogy, I feel like, because there is some such, like... And in, there can be such an intimidation factor in sports, specifically like 
on a public basketball court with people you probably don't know, um, mm-hmm. you're there's a lot of uncertainty on how people are going to act and how welcoming people are going to be. So I feel like you put that so well. Did you have, were there other kids? um, Not to dive into this too much. I'm just, I, I I have, I remember experiencing similar things as a kid. So I'm curious, did you have like an ally in that group, like another little sibling or were they like, what do you remember about that? Didn't, uh, Well, actually, you know, there was like an older girl who like, she was like 13, I was five and she would just like, take me, take me aside and like be like a big sister. And that was really nice. Yeah. But not playing video games, just like showing me her diary and stuff. (laughs) So like, (laughs) not, not anything like helping for video games. So these boys are, you know, they're getting out, they're working through their feelings in a toxic way. Here's something you Mm -hmm. can do, Sam. This is what we call a diary. (laughs) <laughs> that's uh that's absolutely incredible um did this uh how long did this last for you i know you said that it was kind of a long period of and it ingrained in your mind of like oh i'm not ready for games um mm-hmm. did that ever change yeah i guess like uh eventually uh my parents got me a game boy advance one year for for my birthday nice. and Cause that's something that like y- you don't really share. It's not a console. Yeah. So like I got Pokemon crystal and oh. I just like started playing and, you had, and that kind of like y- took off. I'm, gl- I'm glad you brought that up because that was one of the games that you had like floated as a possible title to discuss for the main event, which coincidentally we have, we discussed uh, maybe j- just a couple months ago um, with uh, Isabella Escalante. But uh, oh. tell me about your time with Pokemon crystal. What do you remember? loved just i just remember being very possessive of it because it was like finally something that i owned sure. you know and yeah. this wasn't like my brother's thing or my brother's friend's thing um i mean also just loved you know pokemon in general mm-hmm. i mean who didn't and uh yeah like god spent so many hours playing it yeah is that a have you revisited that title over the years or was it really confined to like that period of your life no i definitely have revisited um i i got one of those like PC emulators for Game Boy yes. Advance and download some bootlegs of all the Pokemon games. And then like when I was in high school, I would play those. And then once when I was like, I want to say like 28, I, I would like play through the emulators. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's like, I feel like such a common thing, especially when we don't, it, it's kind of, it can be difficult to get access to those old games. Like uh, plenty of people do that. Do, um, do you... Are you, have you pl- continued playing the series um, at all? Do you still play the Pokemon games? Not really. I feel like I've they've invented too many new Pokemon, and I'm like too far gone. I, I can't catch up. Oh, is a but thousand I do, like, too much now. for you, Sam? Is that too many to remember? It's a thousand now. It's, it's like it. I think it's at least a thousand. I think they just broke Jesus. the threshold. It's just psychotic. That's. Ugh. Okay, I don't love that. Yeah. Um, no, I don't think I would ever revisit the new games, but yeah. I would. I would review it like the uh, the old ones for sure. Totally, I think that's generally uh, where I fall to. I, I the mm-hmm. most recent ones that I tried was uh, Sword and Shield, which was the first ones on Switch, and I really didn't have like a, it just didn't grab me. And mm-hmm. but I still do enjoy revisiting um, the original series, which we actually did for a games club earlier this year. Have you have you played a Red and Blue and Yellow at all? Uh, yeah, I yeah. Did. Um, mm-hmm. we revisited that for games club. So we played that over like 14 weeks, uh, earlier this year, which was really fun to go back to having so much nostalgia. Um, but, uh, crystal and the gold and silver generation is my favorite. So anytime someone wants to talk about that, I'm down. Um, do you have, did you have a favorite starter or a Pokemon from that generation that you remember? Generally, I always like gravitated towards water Pokemon. Oh, cool. Um, but the only because I feel like, uh, the fire Pokemon were too mainstream yeah. <laughs> and then the grass Pokemon were too weak. So yep. the water Pokemon were always like a nice middle. Yeah. Uh, very, very safe. Um, especially in that like first gen with, with Squirtle. Uh, mm-hmm. that's, uh, really fun. So the Game Boy Advance was sort of the first time it sounds like you had ownership over, um, over, uh, games. Uh, are there other games on that system that you want to shout out some earlier ones for you 
I remember I bought a lot, like I bought a James Bond game thinking it would like simulate the N64 (laughs) experience of GoldenEye. It did not. It was awful. (laughs) Uh, I bought like a Dragon Ball Z game that was also pretty boring. Yeah. I feel like the only game I ever enjoyed on Game Boy Advance or any Game Boy was like the Pokemon games. Gotcha. Like they were designed for that system almost. Yes, uh, definitely good for being on the go. They're really engaging. Um, I can totally relate to that. Um, okay, so like after this Game Boy Advance period, did you continue gaming? Like where did you go from here? I I moved over to like pc stuff but like never like online pc stuff just because our internet connection was never (laughs) fast enough yeah but like i moved towards like um nba live 2001 i wouldn't (laughs) have even realized that they had that on the pc yeah oh my gosh Um, this was before like nba 2k kind of took off and like nba live was like the nba game and so i'd play that a lot that's awesome Um, who's on the cover of 01 uh, Kevin Gardet. Okay, cool, cool, cool. I yeah, yeah, yeah. also loved the live series as well. I think I want to say the one that I played the most was like oh five. It okay. I, Vince Carter might be on the cover. Um, I could also be mixing up a couple years, but um, mm-hmm. that's really cool. Uh, any other? Oh, do you have a favorite team? By the way, not really. I mean, at this point, I just like am rooting for drama and (laughs) storylines. Well, the NBA will provide that. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Um, That's great. Uh, What other, do you want to shout out any other PC titles that you spent some time with? Uh, Call of Duty 1. That was a really huge one for me. Still just Uh, uh, not online though. This would this have just been the campaign for you pretty much? Yeah, just the campaign. Um, Really, our internet connection was awful. (laughs) And then also like this was maybe like 2003 Mm -hmm. and I'm like 10, 11 years old and like wary of the internet and strangers. (laughs) You have the caution of like, of an adult, uh, uh, of letting their kid go to like go on the internet. You had that yourself, uh, and were protecting yourself. Yeah. I watched a lot of like to catch a predator as a kid and like that type of stuff. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And so I was like, someone, someone's going to try and touch me. Yeah. This is not worth it. Uh, uh yeah. that's really cool. Um uh were those most of the like uh titles you played on that uh PC that, that were memorable? Um I remember uh Star Wars Jedi Knight 2 Jedi Outcast. Yeah. That was really fun. Awesome. Um there's a Harry Potter game I think that I really liked. Oh dude, I played the hell out of one and at least one and two on the PC specifically. Yes, the Sorcerer's Stone one. Yeah, yes, yeah. dude, I tried. Uh, so three years, like in 2020, like around how, like Halloween, I was doing a lot more um, streaming of video games, and I was mm-hmm. like, oh, Harry Potter, like the Sorcerer's Stone, that would be a really fun like October game to stream because like it's kind of Harry Potter's kind of always Halloween feeling to me because there's witches and wizards and all that jazz, and mm-hmm. I. Um, had a Mac at the time, and I must have spent like two days trying to find a way to emulate uh, like Harry Potter on the PC, and <laughs> I I failed miserably is what I'm trying to tell you. This is me making it about myself, but uh, the nostalgia was so heavy for those games, specifically mm-hmm. one and two, that I was like, I spent basically two like full work days trying to get this uh, working. Uh, Did you get it? Never, never got it to work. Um, and I wonder now. I use um, a PC now. Uh, I wonder if they would be easier to try to emulate um, somehow. But anyway, that's for another time. Um, but uh, okay, where where did you go? Like after this um, this uh, sort of PC era, did you have any other significant stops? Whether it be like consoles you had or playing uh with others um i i kind of stopped after the pc phase um i think the last game i played on pc was like civ 5 or civ 4 yeah uh but i just spent like way too much time and like my grades started dropping (laughs) and i none of it was online so i wasn't making any friends so i was like (laughs) i gotta like stop this right now um and then i think like ps3 came out and i got that oh cool and then yeah, started playing some some console games there, but like 
also like didn't love that it was like tanking my grades and like yes. messing with my social life. Yeah. So I stopped. That's mm-hmm. a, you know, the it's a love hate relationship sometimes uh, with games, which like I think a lot of people can relate to to this day as like adults and being like, hmm, am I putting time into the things that I want to like achieve or, or like enough time or video games getting in the way of that? It's like a, mm-hmm. it's a constant. And hell, I've made like video games part of my career at this point. So it's like, well, Mm -hmm. I guess it's worked out. But um, uh, do you remember any games from the PS3 that you want to shout out? Uh, There was like that Batman, like like Arkham. Yes, uh, Arkham Asylum. Arkham Asylum, yes. And then Infamous. Um, Those are the only two that like really stuck out for me. Cool. Yeah, Arkham Asylum is, is not, it's a game I've, that I want to play someday. In fact, Vic Michaelis brought it on for like episode six or something. So mm-hmm. like it's, it's been in my, so I, I got to sample it at the time. I did a played like the opening of it and it seemed really cool. Um, uh, I continue to just make it about myself uh, on this podcast. I, I sometimes <laughs> I've said in the pe- many times in the past as a bit, I'll, uh, I'll be like, well, this is the part of the podcast where I make it about myself, but for today, for some reason, Sam, I can't help but continue to do that. <laughs> um, um, I'd love to know um, a little bit about like whatever your relationship is like with gaming today. Mm-hmm. Um, it uh, kind of has been revitalized, I guess. Oh, I, I I went through like a very long phase where I was like no games, just kind of for the reasons we just talked yes. about. Um, and then like last year I decided, you know, like, I think I have enough self-control now. I'm, I'm 30. I, yeah. I think I could get a console and, and play moderately. Uh, so I bought a PS5, um, Ooh. and I've just been like catching up on the hits from like the past 10 years that I haven't yeah. been playing. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Uh, well, Hey, welcome to the family, pal. Glad to have <laughs> yeah. you. Did you get uh, digital or disc? Uh, disc okay cool <laughs> I, d- I had to look at it real quick <laughs> um and not that it matters really at all um what are some of the hits that you've uh revis that you've finally gotten to hit now that you're uh you got a ps5 yeah uh red dead 2 oh cool um, yeah. loved it uh the spider-man stuff did you play um uh the, the like 2018 game and then did you play miles at all I finished half of Miles, yeah. and I got kind of bored because I was like, it feels like 2018. Sure. Like, they feel too similar. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, um, Warzone, although I, I am so bad at Warzone, and I honestly, I've tried playing with Nick Costanza, yes. and I feel so useless, <laughs> yeah. and I also don't understand the point of Warzone. It's so frustrating. Yes. Uh, I yeah, I feel like anyone playing with Nick would probably feel that way because he's, he's very competent uh, and just knows what he's doing. Yeah. Um, uh, any, any other ones that you wanted to shout out? I feel like I interrupted you. Um, I think those have been the, I mean like NBA 2K 23, I guess. Yeah. And, uh, I, I feel like such an old man. Cause like so many of these games, I do have to text someone. Like I'll be texting Nick, like, what is the point of this game? Or like, cause there's like a new genre of games where like a lot of it is just like, you're not fighting or killing anything. You're just kind of living. Yeah. You're like sort of like that, the battle Royale games where you're just trying to last as long as you can. Yeah, or like the one with like um, Norman Reedus, like Death. Oh, Death Stranding, uh, yes. <laughs> yes, I, I was playing that one and I was literally like online, like trying to look up like, what is the point of this? <laughs> <laughs> so funny. Uh, to, to, to affirm you a little bit, of all games, that one makes sense that you would ask that because it's it the creator famously makes games that narratively are can be really strong but also to some confusing and so it mm-hmm. would make sense that like you'd be like why am i carrying this baby around like what a, why am i delivering these packages that whole thing i'm just an uber eats delivery yes. guy i i could do that in real life i don't get it yeah uh <laughs> that's that's really fun thanks for catching me up a bit on um on you know more recent gaming stuff for you um before we go uh, and uh, go to break really quick. Um, would you? Eat, are there is there a game from your history that you haven't gotten to mention yet that you'd really like to? Or is there a game that you've been playing uh, more recently than any of the ones you've mentioned that you'd like to uh, give a little nod to? 
Honestly, I think Warzone. Just yeah. I'm I'm bad at it, and I I don't understand why it's like such a huge cultural uh, thing. Yeah, but I kind of want to understand why people like it so much. Totally. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, I won't be able to answer that for you because I never played it. Um, but okay. I'm sure someone out there, dear listener, uh, t- tweet at the show, and then we can relay that to Sam as well. Um, the, the thing about Warzone that confuses me is the best that I've ever done playing online is i i spent an hour just hiding in a corner yes running away from people and then i finished like top 10 and i'm like this can't be the point of yes. the game that's so funny i i recently played apex legends for the first time and i think again i haven't played warzone so i can't say for sure but i think they mm-hmm. function similarly in that you're on a team a very small team and you're trying to have your squad survive and outlive the other mm-hmm. teams and in warzone does the map like is there a ring that shrinks the map or does it stay the yes same? yes so mm-hmm. apex is kind of similar where they've got like every two or three minutes the map will shrink and i've had similar experiences where sometimes i'm just like hiding or like avoiding mm-hmm. people and you last forever and then other times like it's just yeah i just have a totally different experience yeah um Well, Sam, thank you for walking us through, you know, a synopsis of your history with gaming uh, up until this point. Uh, I'm so proud of you uh, for, you know, understanding that at a certain point you could be you could play games, too. And it's not just for those older kids. Uh, (laughs) You really did it. Um, We're going to take a quick break and then when we come back. We'll get into all things Dynasty Warriors 4. So I'll see you on the other side. Welcome back to Call Me By Your Game. It is I, your host, Connor McCabe. Of course, uh, still here with Sam D. Sam, welcome back. Hey. Uh, We, of course, today are going to be discussing Dynasty Warriors 4, the game that Sam has brought on to discuss for this main event. Um, And like I told you before, Sam, uh, I'm just going to be reading some basic context about the game uh, to set the table for our listener. If at any point you're like, uh, Connor, actually, I've got a correction for you where I want to include this. Jump in at any time. Uh, Don't be shy. Okay. Yeah, that works. Otherwise, here I go. Uh, Dynasty Warriors 4 is a hack and slash video game and the fourth installment if you couldn't have guessed, in the Dynasty Warrior series. You know, you can tell sometimes, I'm already breaking from the script, when I don't, like, read these thoroughly because I'll say stuff like the fourth installment in the series because for some reason Wikipedia always feels like they've got to include that. Um, I'm just being critical of Wikipedia at the at this point. Uh, we know it's the fourth one. It's called Dynasty Warriors 4. Uh, <laughs> it was developed by Omega Force and published by Koei. Uh, the game is available... Uh, and was released on the PlayStation 2 and Xbox and is based on a series of books called Romance of the Three Kingdoms written by uh, by the author Luau uh, Guanzong. Probably mispronounced that, so apologies, uh, Luau. Uh, as the series has progressed, uh, and of course Luau's listening. Uh, that's That felt like how I said that. Uh, as He's se- been dead for about a couple thousand years. Okay, so now I know you're <laughs> definitely listening up in heaven because um, all authors go to heaven, as we know. Um and I totally believe in in, in heaven. Uh, it has strayed further from the actual plot of Romance of the Three Kingdoms, but instead has given the user more input on how the storyline progresses. And also, from what I understand, the game uh, takes some liberties on introducing characters that weren't actually around and all that. Um, so it's it's sort of – there's some stuff that's rooted in history, but of course, there's a lot of fiction here as well. Um, when it was released uh, in Japan – um, it uh, topped the sales charts, sold over 1 million copies within nine days, and received an average of 78 out of 100 on Metacritic's uh, reviews. Um, Sam, uh, before I move on to the next couple bullet points that I'm going to include um, about the game, uh, is there anything, any insight that you have to it, whether it's like uh, the history of that it was pulled from or like uh, mm-hmm. the its release and... Um, just topping the sales charts at the time. I just wanted to open the floor a little bit. Yeah, so it's um, it's sort of like based on a book that was based on historical events. Gotcha. So uh, the historical events that it's based on was set maybe about 2,000 years ago. Mm. 
in China. Um, there's like a, a period of time called the the Three Kingdoms period, which is like kind of just uh, like I think an emperor died and then like three three factions formed yeah. and these three factions just were trying to like fight for the throne. Gotcha. Um, yeah, so that happened two thousand years ago, and then in like I think the fourteen hundreds is when this guy uh, wrote this book called The Romance of the Three Kingdoms based off of that uh, true historical stuff. Gotcha. And then it became like a big like uh, literary phenomenon and then it's like influenced a lot of uh, storytelling in just all of Asia throughout the years. Yeah. And then so this Dynasty Warriors series is based off of that book. Interesting. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, thank you uh, for catching us up. I was just opening up the floor in case you had something to add and you've, I feel like, filled in some really important context for us there. Um, <laughs> thank you. It, it also... <laughs> Um, like e- even just, you know, briefly what I had learned about it, it seems like it c- could have even uh, transcended uh, like those specific cultures where because it even sounds a little Game of Thronesy to me in the sense of like, you know, these kingdoms and factions vying for power. Um, so who knows? Maybe it even uh, it's yeah, its influence is felt even further. Uh um, originally, this game was, uh, like I was saying, released on the PS2 in March 2003. It was later deported, ported to the Xbox in September of the same year in 2000, and in 2005 ported to the PC under the name Dynasties, Dyn- excuse me, Dynasty Warriors 4 Hyper. Two expansions were also released for the PS2 version of the game. Uh, Extreme Legends and, and Empires, uh, those are two separate ones, so Extreme Legends and Empires. And Extreme, of course... Starts with a capital X. Uh, whereas Extreme Legends requires the player to use the original Dynasty Warriors 4 disc to access all of its features, Empires is actually a standalone game uh, that can be played without the original disc. Uh, the game is the first in the Dynasty Warriors series to introduce an Empires expansion pack and the second to include an Extreme Legends title. I'm assuming that these were... Um, this would continue with the series moving forward, if that's how they're phrasing it here. Um, and, and yeah, the series has continued and, of course, uh, inspired uh, many other Warriors-type games. These are often referred to as, like, Musou-type games. So if people know, like, the Hyrule Warrior series or the Fire Emblem, uh, I think it's called Fire Emblem Warriors. They're these, like, big hack-and-slash games often taking place on, these on like, big battlefields. Um, yeah. Really, like, visually uh, impressive games, and I feel like you might know it when you see it. Uh, Sam, is there any mm-hmm. other important context that you think we should include about this game before we hop into your personal history with it? Um, yeah, I think maybe the only other thing is, like, this like this, uh, this topic or, like, games based off of Romance of the Three Kingdoms is, like, so prevalent throughout Asia. It's, like, there are hundreds of titles. Yeah. Some are hack and slash, some are like strategy, mm. but it's like this, uh, this IP has been so kind of like worked through in, in Asia. Interesting. Okay. Very cool. Mm. Uh, so yeah, Stone's Throne, you might find, uh, uh many other games, uh, based off, based yeah. off of this lore. Uh, very cool. Well, let's get into it. Uh, how did you come to play this game in the first place? Yeah, I, I started playing this when I was 13 years old. Uh, for like life context, uh, I just moved from Pennsylvania to Mississippi. Oh, cool. I didn't know that you had, I mean, not that I would, well, now I'm going to remember forever. Yeah. Yeah. Over, yeah. But, um, uh, that's cool. Where did, where did you live in Pennsylvania? Um, there's this college town called state college. It's where Penn state is. Oh, very cool. Uh, yeah. um, but sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Um, was this a part of your uh, PC days? Um, I would say it was like the end of the PC days, gotcha. so to speak. Yeah, yeah, it marked the end, I guess. Awesome. So um, I'll sort of put you back on on the on track. And you were saying that this had uh, you started playing this, I think, when you had moved to Mississippi. Yeah, like I moved to Mississippi, and it was like a really shitty time to move. Um, also, like I remember, we lived in like the crappiest apartment. It was like filled with mold oh, and all of no. our stuff was in boxes. Yeah, because like we had just moved and my dad was kind of like, yeah, we'll buy a house. But like, you know, we'll just like live in this place for like a few months yes. while we're like looking. And like a few months turned into like a year. Yeah. And so I was just miserable because like we also couldn't unpack our boxes because it was like, oh, no, no, no. We're, we're shopping around for my houses. Oh, boy. 
Right. Yeah. And yeah, so it was just like a truly awful situation. And I feel like this entire apartment complex was just all people who like had just moved to this town and just needed like a place to live for a yes, few months. Yes, for sure. Um, yeah, and I started playing it because like there was a kid, me and like two other kids like lived in this apartment complex and we're all pretty like grumpy about just having <laughs> moved there. And like, we're all kind of desperate for friends and awkward. And this one kid had a PS2 and he had Dynasty Warriors 4 and he would like invite us over to play. Okay. And so for one summer when I was 13, this is all I ever like did was Dynasty Warriors 4. That's so cool. Uh, gosh, I feel like we've already gotten so much uh, a wonderful context uh, to dive into. Um, when you think about the game, though, is where I think I'll start. Uh, mm-hmm. When you think about the game... Do you remember first playing it or like what those that early time was like in your impressions of the game? Yeah, I'd never played a hack and slash before. Um, and I'd never like uh, I'd never played a game that I guess like was so like visually fun that like combined some of the elements of like like Mortal Kombat and old school fighting games yeah. with like just like open world running around. Totally. Um, and I also like, just liked how many characters there were and how like well-defined each of the characters were. Like they all had their own personalities and like very special moves. Yes. Yeah. Um, that's, that's, I'm glad to hear that because, you know, doing a little research for this game that I've, I've admittedly not incredibly familiar with. I'm only familiar with the Dynasty Warriors series in the context that like, it's where, the like Muso game sort of came from uh, contextually mm-hmm. within the history of video games. But um, upon doing research, watching like videos of people reviewing the game or people just playing it, I was really hopeful that all of these characters I was seeing on screen and like the people from different factions and whatnot, that I was at least thinking like, oh, wow, they could probably do a lot with this. And it sounds like they did with the characters themselves. Yeah, I think part of it is because like it is um, it is based off of a real IP and like this book is like maybe like the Chinese equivalent or the Asian equivalent of like Shakespeare. Yeah. In that like so many of these characters have like entered like just like idioms like like in English, if you call someone a Romeo, you know, that means something and you're referencing Romeo and Juliet in Chinese. Like there are so many characters that kind of have entered the language in that way. That's really cool. Was this like some like so? W- let me start here with these characters. So you you were like thought they were really cool. Do you did you have favorites that you remembered? Whether it was like to play as or to just like see on screen. Yeah, uh, there's this one guy called uh, Guan Yu, who um, is like very probably one of the most famous characters from the book, mm-hmm. and his level of fame has gotten like so because he's like a real person who lived two thousand years ago. Yeah. His, like, level of fame is so great that he's become, like, a deity in certain oh, religions. Wow. Like, you can travel Asia and see shrines built for him. And, like, you'll see, like, people praying to him. Wow. Um, yeah. And so, like, this was something that I was always kind of, like, aware of. Like, these books. And, like, my parents always tried to get me to read them. Yes. To, like, connect me with my culture. And I was like, no. <laughs> uh, they're boring. But then I started playing this game. And I was like, holy shit, this is awesome. Yes. Like, yeah. It's like, huh, suddenly Sam is really interested in this. I wonder why. That's that's cool. Also, like, not this is a total uh, sidetrack moment here, but it'd be like, it's a case to, for video games uh, to be, like, a good thing to parents almost. It's like, hey, look, look what it got, like, Sam into. Or, like, some kids, like, I knew, I know growing up, this is a different example, but, like, learned how to read or became better readers because of reading text and video games. Uh, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Well, one of the reasons I like call of duty one so much and that I don't like the new call of duties is because after playing call of duty one, like the first thing I would do was like go on Wikipedia and read about like D day and like, yeah. different guns they used back then. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, that's, uh, uh, it's really fun. What else, is there anything else about the game that sticks out to you uh, uh, as far as like what you enjoyed looking back at it, um, I, I think that like I really loved how they kept so many of the important historical uh, battles in, mm-hmm. um, kind of like Call of Duty and like D Day. Like they have moments um, 
dedicated to those things where you can play through those events and, and that just feels very cool. That's awesome. Uh, was this something, would it, and I, this is, anytime I ask like a question about the, how the game goes itself, I always feel a little foolish because it's something I could have looked up at a certain point, <laughs> but I'm curious being that there is some history tied to this and uh, to this game, um, some historical, some historical context, um, would you be able to play in the game and sort of like write a new path for a character or or would each character's sort of story um, follow the path that it was intended? Does that make any sense? Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> like when you play in campaign mode and you pick a character, um, that character is usually tied to one of like the kingdoms that they're fighting yes. for. Like they're a general in that. So you are playing the same campaign through that character's perspective. Gotcha. But if it happens to be like a huge character, like one of these, like um, one of the leads of the mm-hmm. book, let's say, then like they will have like maybe certain special events because they are just so like pivotal and and you'll play as them. Okay, gotcha. Th- thank yeah. you. Um, when you would play this game, uh, y- you know, with your friends, um would you two would, was this something that you'd be able to play together would you pass off the controller i'm curious um there was like a fighting game element to where we could just like go head to yeah, head i think yeah i saw this yes um i don't remember if there was a dual campaign i remember like i felt like it was pretty collaborative at least um Honestly, we were all like nerding out over the history. It would be like one person would be playing and another person would be reading the Wikipedia page. Oh, that's awesome. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. That's really cool. Uh, Do you remember, is this something that like, uh, did it always stay at your friend's house or did did you, I mean, I I don't know, did you ever take this game home and play the PS2? Did you, do you remember spending a lot of time with the game? I'm curious. I I just remember like going to his house in the morning and then staying till the evening and like just playing at his house. Um, because like everything at my place was in boxes, it's like I wouldn't even want to take the place oh, thing back. Yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, just playing at his place exclusively. Okay, cool. Um, getting, I want to dive into a little more of the context of of this time in your life. We've gotten already mm-hmm. some really great details, but I want to start with doing a little scene painting. Um, as best as you can remember, looking back at this kid's apartment, um, uh, I'd love to know like. Uh, what it was like inside and like where the room where you would be playing this game. Can you like draw out any details for me, you know, this far in the future? Yeah. Um, not the nicest apartment. Uh, it was like a, Hence the whole building, like a living the complex. Yeah, yeah. Just a living room and a TV. The guy was like, a um, he was like a single dad and like, not a, like a, like a really nice dad yeah. but like also kind of like a single dad like didn't take care of the place that well totally yeah <laughs> uh, and then his like his son the kid i was playing yes. with was like here for the summer oh he was like visiting for the summer yeah and then also kind of like i i mean i never got into it but i think there may have been some custody things for sure yeah right and like i was okay so it was that kid who had the ps2 it was me who had just moved to mississippi and was like very grumpy to be there not excited and then there was like another kid who was um uh, a chinese kid who grew up in germany interesting and then just immigrated in the united states so he spoke english with a chinese slash german accent oh really <laughs> yeah wow um yeah d- d- and you all three spent like time time together playing this game that summer yeah Wow. Do you, and do you keep in touch with these these two kids at all to this day, or was it tr- truly just isolated to that? Uh, we we stayed friends for maybe like one or two more years, sure. but then we just drifted apart. Yeah, especially like at that age, and like I'm sure we had like access to like AOL and some Messenger and stuff, but like um, it was a lot different than obviously today being able to keep in contact. Like, I don't know. You meet someone one time and they follow you on Instagram and suddenly you just like kind of know about this person's life forever that you Truly, met one yeah. time. It's so strange how that can happen. But of course, very different experience that you had with these boys. Um, it's also weird because like my our parents all keep in touch still. So actually, if I wanted to find them, I would just talk to my parents. Oh, wait, your parents keep in touch with these kids' parents? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, uh, that's that's so interesting. Uh, um, do they do they do they live in the same town? No, I, I think like they were all we were all Chinese, yeah. and you know, there's not a huge Chinese population in Mississippi, so I think that's why my parents kept in touch so much. Okay, cool, that makes sense. Um, mm-hmm. Do you have any memories uh, from this? Uh, you know, this summer and playing this game with your friends, whether it be like broad or like specific moments uh, that come to mind when you think back to like hanging out. Uh I just remember like when we were hanging out and playing, it was so nice because I didn't have like a single care in the world. Yeah. And like all the bullshit that comes with like being a 13 year old who just moved to a new city was like gone. Yeah. Um, And then I'd go back to my place with the mold and the boxes and like be so angry and depressed. And like I'd go to like my new middle school and I'd hate it. Mm -hmm. But then like we would go to his place and be like, okay, we're just going to focus on video games, nothing else. That's, uh, that's great. And I'm really glad you had that at that time. I'm sure that was like, uh, probably meant a lot to you. Um, and it was meaningful. That's really cool. Um, well, um, Sam, uh, I've gotten to hear so much, uh, great detail from you, you know, about the game itself, but also the context of, of your life when you experienced it. Um, a cu- couple questions for you. One is mm-hmm. that because I almost wrapped us up, but I'm going to pivot really quick. Have you revisited this game throughout your life at all, or was it just this like time period that you played it? I when I got my PS3 a few years later, I bought the recent, the most recent version. Oh, I cool. Say like Dynasty Warriors Seven, but like I feel like they just took too many creative liberties <laughs> yeah. with it. Like they they strayed from the historical accuracy mm-hmm. and the books accuracy. I've always wanted to revisit it, but like there's like 14 versions now and I don't never really know which one I should play and like which one is the yeah, best one. Yeah, totally. Uh, that can be difficult. Yeah. And I was thinking about it in a different context today, but just how difficult it is to, um, you know, game preservation as a whole is in really dire straits. But like, I feel like when I think of like movies or music, when you're revisiting old media, like even though sometimes preservation there is rough, you can there's still so many ways to watch a movie or listen to like a track but playing a game you like unless you know how to emulate something and even that can be a struggle you need like a system and a tv it can <laughs> run on and it all has to work uh so it's definitely a challenge um but uh i guess to to pivot back to me sort of wrapping this section up for us uh regarding either the game um or the context of your life, is there anything else you wanted to include about this experience? Um, I guess when I did revisit it a few years later, I was playing it by myself. And the one thing that I noticed that, that wasn't as satisfying as when I was playing it with my friends was like, hack and slash games are pretty boring yeah. just like his games <laughs> and it's like the fun was like reading about the historical context sure. and about these true events and like the cultural stuff yeah and it's like oh without anybody to like read that with and like talk about it afterwards yeah. it, it kind of like kills it a little bit yeah like it's almost like uh, i feel like this has come up a lot on the show it was the like activity you did to hang out and like the hanging out was was like the flavor but the activity was just like whatever you were doing to facilitate the hang of you and these two kids yeah that and just kind of like learning about this like big piece of like history and culture that i guess i'd never touched you know totally um well you know as we sort of transition to the to the end of the show would you do me a favor and can you wrap up whatever place this game held for you uh, what Dynasty Warriors for, like, in your life? Um, you mean, like, a sentence? Yeah, like, put a bow on it, like, if you were to have to summarize, like, whatever place this held. Okay, yeah, uh, Dynasty Warriors 4, uh, gosh, it, it got me through, like, one of the most difficult transitions in my life. Awesome. Uh, well, Sam, we've got a little more uh, fun stuff to do together today, but thank you so much for bringing on this game. Uh, It was so much fun to hear from you and honestly learn a lot more uh, about you. These are some of my favorite episodes when I get to have someone on that I'm very friendly with and that uh, like get along with great, but like have never had a significant time to to get to know. So thank you so much. This has been a lot of fun to like to just hang out and hear and learn more about you. Um, Thanks, man. You bet. Uh, 
Well, I'll lead us in to two post-show segments that I got prepared for you. The first of which is the Fact Me by Your Game segment. And this is just where I share fun facts about the game that my guest brought on with them. Um, I only have one today. I normally try to have at least two. Um, but this fact comes from a uh, – there's a, there's a great YouTube uh, channel called Did You Know Gaming. This fact is not from that. This is from a channel called The Fourth Snake. <laughs> who loves the Dynasty Warrior series so much that they made their own Did You Know uh, video um, to, like, I mean, like, in the style of the channel. Um, but anyway, um, the I'll just go ahead and read off this fact, and I guess I'll just pose it as a question to you, Sam. Did you know that Dynasty Warriors was originally a one-on-one -on -one fighting game in the style of Soul Calibur or Tekken? I, I did not know that, but I, I could see it actually, and they kept some of the elements of that. Yeah, yeah. You had mentioned earlier talking about like um, you know taking so some of the like the feeling of playing like a Mortal Kombat game to like an open open area or an action game, and I feel like mm -hmm. uh, you put it really well, and you can see this this um, like how they would have made that transition. So um, originally, uh, series creator Hasashi Koizuma. Uh, stated in an interview with Polygon that he wanted to make a fighting game but wanted to do so at a company uh, that didn't already have like a robust fighting game or like a, a development scene for that um, because he didn't want it to get sort of like lost in the shuffle of other great games that are of the same genre. So he ended up partnering with uh, Koei, the company we had referenced earlier, who uh, mostly at the time did strategy games. Uh, and the shift uh, to the more Battlefield scenario came with the dawn of the PS2. Um, I actually don't remember whether or not that was Dynasty Warriors 4 that made the transition. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's interesting to like – you can look up the Dynasty Warriors 1 and I would assume at least 2. And um, you can see the way that the characters move. It's, it's you know – it's a side-by-side -side fighting game, but they can sort of shift in the world a little bit and they keep facing each other. Yeah. Um, Anyway, that's my that's the Fact Me By Your Game segment uh, for the episode. And, and it'll lead us into our final segment, the game recommendations. Now, uh, Sam, as I told you before the show, this segment is my one forced tie-in to the movie Call Me By Your Name, where <laughs> I am going to treat Dynasty Warriors 4 as your passionate uh, summer fling in Italy that unfortunately is not going to work out. You're going to break up. And... In order to help you get over this breakup, I'm going to provide you uh, three uh, possible flings for you to help forget about Dynasty Warriors 4. Uh, and each of these is going to have something in common with that game because I find familiarity goes a long way. Um, mm -hmm. So I've got three for you today, as I've already said. Now, the first one is if you love your three kingdoms, which I've kind of found out that you do, but you'd rather play a more relaxed tactical RPG game. Uh, I'll go ahead and recommend a game for the NES called Romance of the Three Kingdoms. I think literally the title of the of the book. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> did you ever have you ever played tactics games at all or tactical RPGs? I guess you played Civ a little bit. I played Civ and I played Command and Conquer. Interesting. This I think this game is probably a little too uh, too old to be fun. Uh, there's a word I'm missing. <laughs> Old is such a, it's it's a little uh, reductory. But um, anyway, if you're looking for that, that game is out there for you. Uh, your second recommendation is that if you like your warrior style games, you like these big hack and slash uh, games where you're destroying a bunch of enemies at once, but you actually would rather have a little more robot in here. You want it to be mech based. I'll recommend to you the game Dynasty Warriors Gundam. You're playing as a Gundam doing this thing. I'm going to look that up real quick. Oh, what is folks, that? I think we have a peaked interest. Okay. So uh, so if you just need, like, you love that style of game, but you want a twist on it, there's that. There's also, like, I don't know if you're a One Piece fan, but I found out there's a One Piece style Warriors game Whoa. as well. So... It's a genre that has definitely been like iterated on, and we already talked about the Hyrule Warrior series. But, um, but my recommendation for you there is Dynasty Warriors Gundam. Um, and lastly, is if you what you love about these games is you just love 
a wave of enemies coming at you. They don't stop and they don't stop. You love that challenge. If you like that, but you don't want to press a button, I'll go ahead and recommend to you Vampire Survivors. Have you heard of this game? I have not. I'm going to look that up too. Okay. This game has came out last year and like swept the gaming landscape. Uh, and what I mean by that is it became incredibly popular. It's a game where you're basically constantly surrounded by waves of enemies and you just move. You don't press any buttons to attack, but your character does like passive attacks as you're moving. And the more enemies you kill, the means you get more experience and then you can sort of upgrade your abilities. So by the end, you're kind of like a walking tornado um, and nothing can really touch you. But this game, I actually think I do totally recommend to you because uh, I think it is a fantastic game. It's like 8-bit kind of? Yes, it's a, it's in like an old art style, uh, but it is okay. so fun and it's so addicting. And the longest that a round can be is 30 minutes, like if you survive the whole time. But when you start off, you'll probably survive for like a couple minutes at a time, but it's a really, really fun game. Um, anyway, I'll wrap up the game recommendations. I'll repeat those for us today. We've got Romance of the Three Kingdoms, Dynasty Warriors Gundam, and Vampire Survivors. Uh, that'll bring us to the end of the segment, and that'll actually bring us to the end of the show. So uh, before we go and plug whatever we want, again, I already, I already said it, but Sam, thanks so much for coming on the podcast today. This was a blast having you on. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Hunter. You bet. Um, I know we plugged Harold Knight earlier, but is there anything else that you want to plug uh, on your way out today? Um... No, I think mainly Harold Knight. Okay, cool. Well, I'll put a link to Headbutt's next show. So if you're in the LA area listener and you want to see some great improv, there's going to be a link to a great show where you can go see Sam and a bunch of wonderful people uh, and, and at the UCB Theater. So check that out. Uh, but I'll go ahead and close this out with some plugs of my own. The show art uh, for Call Me By Your Game is done by Glenn J. You can find him and his other great work on Instagram at Glenn with two N's dot J A. Why? Uh, you can also follow the show on Instagram, Twitter, and Blue Sky if you'd like. This show is produced by the great Jeremy Schmidt. You can thank him by get by listening to his podcast, Video Games, a comedy show, wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, I can be found on social media on uh, Twitter, Instagram, and Blue Sky as well. I stream on Twitch sometimes, although it's been a while, at twitch.tv slash consiscool69. And lastly, I already plugged the Patreon earlier, but if you like me and the discussions that I have with people about video games, I think you're going to love what you find over at Patreon. It's where all of our bonus content lives. So if you can't get enough, you want to hear me on more podcasts and a bunch of other great people, including the Reactivators boys that we referenced a bunch on this show, uh, <laughs> check us out there at patreon.com slash supernpcradio where we are uh, wrapping up our Sonic Adventure Games Club right now. We're going to be covering another game, which uh, you'll know by the time the next episode comes out what that game will be for the last quarter of the year. Uh, and I do a monthly version of this show where I have people on to discuss uh, a game that we've all played recently. Uh, and coming up for the month of October will be Firewatch with actually Mike Christian is going to be on that episode. Oh, our, our sweet boy. Um, nice. Also uh, Mikey McCuller and Roxy Polk from the network. Uh, again, you can find that at patreon.com slash super NPC radio. But that'll do it. For this episode of Call Me By Your Game, we will see you on the next one.